Okay. Well, thank you so much for having me. I am the biggest talk, especially by you. Also, I'm just going to let you know that because I wanted to talk about the, the workshop, um, so you just want my usual talk. Don't feel free to me that a bunch of this is actually just big ideas. It's really slides for all of it. Okay, so I'm going to try to just talk. And the top of the workshop is how to get machines to understand and interact with humans. And since this talk together, computer scientists and developmental technologists, the central idea is that to get computers to learn to understand and interact with humans, it should help us to first better understand how little humans learn to understand and interact with other humans themselves. So the idea for this workshop is to know what are the big picture lessons we've learned from studying human development can be translated into designs for machine. So today, I'm going to suggest one picture lesson I think we can learn, which is fact. And then I'm going to tell you about two sets of data from my lab, which are sort of related that begin to flesh out this big idea. Okay, but so the first part of the idea. I just want to say first, this picture is not unique. Many people make questions along similar. And the version I give you today is the version that I developed with my graduate student led a recent review. Okay, so the general idea is infants come into the world with a distinct motivation to engage with other people. They find other people more interesting, more important, and more valuable than other things in the world around them. And that controls the experience from which they I'm going to try to explain what this idea means, partly by contrasting with other ideas. Okay, so I hypothesize that very early emerging motivation to pay special attention to other people affects everything about infant experience in the world. Although Turing imagined infants as blank sheets of paper that had to be written on by the world, a century of research on infants has established definitively at this point that infants are not passive or blank. Infants choose what to look at and when to pay attention and when to look away. That is from a machine learning perspective, infants cho choose their own experiential diet and structure and curriculum. From the moment of birth, they are never passive learners. Okay, so this idea of infants as active is increasingly well known among computer scientists and machine learning researchers. But it opens up another question, which less well known. When infants choose their experiences, what governs their choice? What property of the input are they optimizing? Or what is the objective function of the selection process they use? But for many computer scientists these days, the answer to this question, the intuitive answer is something like, infants are maximizing expected information gain. The idea is that infants are driven to know as much as possible about the world. And the active can also leave as much as possible about the world to predict the next one of experience. The idea would be, as if around the world, they are also constantly making predictions of what is about to happen, using the world model, and checking these predictions against what actually happens. Anytime the prediction is wrong and something unexpected happens, that's an important signal to the infant that there's something more to learn. This general idea fits the basic pattern of how infants choose their experiences as they look more at anything unexpected or novel. And as Lisa Vincent, among others, has shown really elegantly, infants selectively and rationally explore the surprising objects and events. And researchers in both computer vision and machine learning more broadly have shown that this drive to learn and predict the patterns in the world can be powerful learning objectives and can be used to drive learning of every geometries and identities to the meanings of scenes, to the meanings of words, to intuitive physics. Okay, so so far so good for the that infants pay attention to patterns in the environment, try to predict them, gradually get bored of anything predictable, and direct attention towards anything unpredictable. For today is, would a machine that was just optimized to uh, just optimizing expected information, learn to understand and interact with humans the way a baby does. Right. Babies pay so much 
is that just a damn consequence of their motivation to, to predict as much as possible about the world. So I'm going to hypothesize that the answer to this question is no. But before I do, I want to acknowledge that many smart people currently think the answer is yes. And most fundamentally, this is an empirical question. And it's one that I think the people in this workshop are really unique pose, poised to answer. Okay, so for people who think the answer is yes, the argument goes, maybe it's a rule to pay attention to unpredictable and informative events in the infant's actual environment. And this rule consequence of making infants pay attention to people and social interactions. And people's actions are hard to predict. People are constantly behaving in novel and unexpected ways. So we might pay attention to people more than other aspects of the whenever people do unpredictable things. Since this happens a lot, the ladies are disproportionately interested in people. Or babies might learn a generalization that people have done unpredictable or unexpected or informative behaviors in the past. And this might make babies monitor people in the environment, even if at the moment they're even predictably or not even doing much at all. So for example, there's a hypothesis that when infants go another person's case to see what they're looking at, this behavior reflects infants' general goal to maximize information gain, combined with a learned judge the part of the scene that other people are looking at, often contains something interesting or novel to learn. So I hope that makes it clear that it is plausible and intuitive that a general rule to maximize learning and information gain could get a machine to learn perhaps about people. But even though it's plausible and intuitive, I'm going to argue that it's wrong or at least incomplete as a count of what babies are doing. Because I believe, and I want to convince you, that infants have at least one other complete motive for looking at people, a different objective function driving their attention and therefore controlling their diet or them for learning. And that is, infants are motivated to form and learn about social relationships not as a proxy for being able to perform, but directly as a motivation all of its own. So if you just back up for a second from the picture of infants as learning machines, and instead consider infants as infants or as biological organisms, this point actually seems pretty obvious because human infants are exceptionally helpless when they are born and depend on emotional bonds with adult caregivers for Infants are safest when an adult is carrying them or otherwise paying them. And this means infants have a strong incentive to monitor and elicit adult intent, attempt emotional investment. Looking at people is a way for infants to both monitor and deepen emotional bonds with their caregivers. Okay, so what I'm saying is the predictability and in people's behavior is not the thing or not the only thing that drives infants and people. Sometimes infants might look at a person because of a motivation to learn as possible, if the person is or might be behaving unpredictably or informatively. But lots of times infants look at a person because of a distinct motivation, specifically to monitor and deepen relationships. And this motivation, of course, then influences the infants put infants get out the world making their input even more dominated by people and social interactions than they otherwise would have been. It's possible that actually this motivation to care about and form and deepen relationships also constrains or biases the infants, the inferences infants make based on their own. Okay, so that's the big idea. And the claim here is that we want a computer system to learn about humans and to learn to interact with humans the way a baby, we can't design that machine just to maximize learning, curiosity, and prediction. It also needs a distinct social motivation to attend to people because people are the subject of relationships. Okay, that's a big grand idea. And uh, of course, it's still an empirical question. Um, so what I'm going to show you today uh, in this pretty short talk, just two lines of evidence. Evidence that I think are a big idea. Um, 
In the first experiment, test the hypothesis that influential people because of and in virtue of uh, inferred social relationships. And then the second experiment, one more direct assists that just cognitive and neural processes underlie infant's attention to social relationships versus to other unpredictable ones. Okay, but first, I'll start with the first one, uh, which is new work I'm really excited about that I've been doing with Alice. Okay, so in this work, we've been asking, how could you test whether infants look at people because of for relationships rather than pretty of the people's behavior? And it's hard to ask uh, about that directly. So what we do is we give people, we give infants a chance to look at um, somebody based on an inferred relationship with someone else. Okay, so let me explain how this experiment goes. So infants um, are already in a strong relationship with their caregiver, but in our experiment, they're gonna get to see um, two new characters they don't know that are played by puppets. And with one of these puppets, their caregiver will have an affiliative interaction. Their caregiver will show evidence of a relationship by imitating. And then we're gonna ask whether compared to the puppet that their parent didn't imitate, whether infants now infer a social relationship to the puppet that their own caregiver affiliated with. Okay, so we did this experiment over Zoom. We had parents record themselves um, blind. They didn't know what the videos were gonna look like. And then we edited them so that it created the appearance of a social interaction. And here's how those videos look. Whoop, whoop. Krika, Krika. E, e. E, e. Okay, so every infant saw a video of their own caregiver. The caregivers spent audio instructions and they used webcams at home to make a video. And importantly, the caregivers didn't know which puppet they imitated and which puppet they didn't because we cropped the puppets in the videos afterwards. And of course, we counterbalanced which side the puppet was on and whether it was the orange or the blue puppet that the parent imitated. Okay, so again, what we want to know is after seeing the character imitate one of the two puppets, since we know that infants treat imitation as affiliated behavior, will they infer that they have a potential relationship that, to that same And the way that we decided to do that is we took advantage of the fact that infants map audio and visual cues together. So if you shouldn't for example, one video of somebody hitting a drum and one video of somebody playing peekaboo. I made a video of peekaboo and the infants will look towards the peekaboo video. Okay, and here we showed the puppet two simultaneous um, puppets, but we gave them the audio of just one voice calling the infant's own name. So if the infant was called Ashley, the puppet would call, hi, Ashley. Okay, so here's what that looks like. Hi, Lisa. Hi. Hi. Okay, so both puppets move them simultaneously, and only one voice calls to the infant and uses the infant's name. And the thing we measure is which puppet the infant looks towards while hearing that voice. Okay, so I'm going to show you the proportion of time spent looking at the imitated puppet um, in caregiver condition. Okay, and so here 50% of, you know, 0.5 per, uh, proportion would be looking equally. And you can see that uh, on the whole, infants spend more time looking at the puppet that their caregiver imitated. Um, and, right, okay. Um, however, they, the, pup, the same infants did not show that effect for a puppet imitated by a string. And the way we tested this is that every infant saw both the video of their own caregiver and also a video of another infant's caregiver's work. Every servant saw both their own caregiver's video and another infant's caregiver with the same, with a new set of puppets. Okay, so, um, oops, just show you all this data again. Okay, so uh, this is the data that we showed from the control condition where infants have another uh, caregiver. Uh, and in this case, infants looked equally at both puppets. And then the last plot here is showing application with new group of 24 infants 
um, in whom we replicate both that when the caregiver imitated a puppet and then one voice called the baby's name, baby looked towards the puppet their caregiver had imitated. But when the audio was just music, not a voice calling their name, then infants showed no. Okay, sorry for the mess right there. Okay, that was just evidence that um, infants looking at um, characters in the world depends not just on how predictable or unpredictable their behavior is, but also on infants' own social relationships. So in the study I just showed you, infants looked toward and knew the puppet um, that they inferred they had a social relationship with after observing that puppet uh, interact their own parents. Okay. So that's evidence that infants pay attention to social relationships. And um, now I'm going to test the idea that so paying social attention has a distinct um, cognitive and neural basis from um, attention to generally interesting statistical or unpredictable events. Okay. Um, and the, the idea behind this study comes from the fact that in adults, distinct parts of prefrontal cortex um, are associated with uh, different kinds of processing. So for adults, if a stimulus or experience uh, um, has a violation of, of the expected pattern of learned patterns about the world, that's to redirect their attention to something that they weren't expecting. Um, then many of my studies, you know, for decades have found that those kinds of processes are associated with lateral prefrontal cortex, whereas Processing stimuli that adults find to be um, social, self-relevant, or valued is associated with a different region, medial prefrontal cortex, uh, in prefrontal cortex, namely in the, in the medial part of the prefrontal cortex. And so the, this distinction in the parts of prefrontal cortex that are recruited when directing attention towards unexpected patterns versus valued social stimuli um, that seems like an obvious way to test the hypothesis that I started with, that, that infants also show a similar distinction between looking at things because they're unexpected versus looking at things because they are um, social, self-relevant, and valued. But the first question is, is it, could we even imagine that we would be able to measure this distinction in infants? And the reason this concern is reasonable is um, until quite recently, you know, the standard view was that prefrontal cortex in infants is um, really immature. It's one of the last parts of the brain to be myelinated. It's wildly undermyelinated uh, in preverbal infants. And some people even thought that prefrontal cortex might be functionally silent in infants. So of course, if that were true, we wouldn't be able to test uh, whether these distinct motivations exist. Okay, so to test this idea, um, or, or rather, to provide evidence that it's reasonable to start to start looking for distinct prefrontal regions in infants, I'm going to first show you some data from a different line of experiments um, using fMRI. This is work I started with Ben Dean when he was my graduate student, and uh, it was designed to ask kind of what what aspects of cortical function could we even begin to hope to measure in uh, awake human beings. Okay, so in this, for the this study, we had uh, pre-verbal human babies um, scanned in an fMRI machine. We used a custom coil to hold their head reasonably still and get the, the coils close to their skulls. And um, you can see that was the paddle that measured their frontal cortex. We had special coils around the frontal cortex. And then the babies went into the bore with an adult there uh, to monitor that they're okay. And they could watch through the mirror above their head um, videos that we played for them on the back of the bore. And in this study, infants saw videos from two conditions. One set were um, kids interacting with them socially, and the other set of videos were non-social scenes, so just uh, the natural environment. Um, and so the first set of data that we collected um, are published. Those were collected by Ben Dean. But since then, um, my current graduate student, Heather Kosakowski, has done a massive replication of all of those studies. Um, and in particular, with uh, the cl her collaborator, Boris Kyle, shown here, they've developed an even better infant coil that you can see along the bottom 
um, that has two sliding panels to cover the frontal cortex and room for uh, better headphones to fit inside it. So we now actually have much more data. And one thing I just want to highlight is that the new data, um, the new coil has done a fabulous job. So the, um, this, the anterior compartments with 10 elements each slide closed horizontally over the top of the infant's head. Um, and this has increased our signal to noise ratio in the infant fMRI um, by, we think, three times and also made for uh, more effective sound isolation. So that is very exciting and lets us ask this question of, is there activity in infants in medial prefrontal cortex? These are um, infants aged uh, four to eight months old, on average six months old. Okay, so in adults, as I told you, social, self-relevant, or valued stimuli tend to activate medial prefrontal cortex. And in this study, um, the socially interacting videos of children um, did evoke more activity in medial prefrontal cortex in adults compared to the um, non-social scenes. Um, so in Ben Dean's data set, the published data set, we could look um, at the same pattern of activation in six, or the same question in six children. And he found that um, in these six infants, there was um, the same pattern, so activity in medial prefrontal cortex, more for looking at faces than for looking at scenes. Um, six babies seemed like a lot at the time, but actually Heather has heroically collected uh, way more data in the years since then. Um, so she collected 23 um, kids scanned on the, um, the original coil, the same one that Ben uh, was using, and another 23 babies, also between two and 10 months, um, on this uh, amazing new coil. Um, and combining data from all of those infants from anyone in whom we had enough data to do a region of interest analysis, so to identify voxels in medial prefrontal cortex in one set of data and measure its activity in a left out data set. And so that was 30 infants aged two to 10 months old. Looking in those infants, we can see in medial prefrontal cortex, a highly selective response to faces um, in infants. Okay, so that was pretty amazing, especially if you thought prefrontal cortex might be functionally silent in babies. Um, but it also is good news for the question that we're trying to talk about today, because if prefrontal cortex is functionally active in babies, and in particular, if medial prefrontal cortex has functions that are similar to those in adults, then maybe we could measure, we could measure the same dissociation between prefrontal regions in babies to test the hypothesis that babies looking towards social stimuli is driven by a different mechanism than they're looking towards other unexpected events. Okay, so to test that hypothesis in work with Lindsay Powell, we used functional near infrared spectroscopy, which is a different neuroimaging tool that measures a signal very similar to that of fMRI, blood oxygenation changes in the baby's cortex. But it, uses, it measures this using a lightweight cap that wraps around the baby's prefrontal cortex while the baby sits on their parent's lap um, watching the stimuli. Okay, so we can use this tool to test whether the similar divisions that we see in adults are also explain infants looking. So to start with, I told you that in adults, lateral prefrontal cortex is associated with um, directing attention towards violations of learned statistics. Um, so we wanted to test whether the same thing is true in babies. And to do this, we first exposed them to videos of people, of one person, so they saw one speaker, speaking a stream of nonsense syllables, but that had in it the kind of statistical structure that we think infants this age can learn. So anytime the baby heard the syllable mu, it was always followed by fa. So mu, fa, um, gay was always followed by na. So mu, fa, gay, na, gay, na, mu, fa, right? And we know from tons of previous research by Jenny Safran and Dick Aslan and many other people that after a few minutes of exposure to this kind of statistical structure, infants learn the structure and begin to predict it, which means that now, if you give them um, a violation of that learned structure, so if, if one speech stream, they hear a speech stream that has a violation like na wo, na wo, um, where wo was always followed by C, right? So 
so Wona is a, a sequence they never heard before, compared to a sequence they did hear before, Gena Gena, and um, the infants will look longer to the sequence that violates their learned statistics. Okay, so here, our hypothesis is that, like adults, it will be activity in lateral prefrontal cortex that predicts um, infants greater looking to violations of learned statistics. So to measure that, we measured activity in um, lateral prefrontal cortex while infants were first exposed to the statistical speech, and we compared it to a repeated control condition where there was no statistics to learn. So a different speaker who every time she said a syllable, she just said the same syllable over and over and over again. Um, and this let us measure the activity in lateral prefrontal cortex specific to hearing the to learning and encoding the statistical structure in the first place. Okay, and in lateral prefrontal cortex, we found that on the whole, there was a small um, increase in activity during the statistical speech compared to the, um, the repeating control. But the key prediction is that the amount of activity would predict the um, looking towards stimuli that violate the learned statistic. Um, and so the way we tested this hypothesis is we looked at individual differences. So for each baby, I'm going to show you on the x-axis how active their lateral prefrontal cortex was while they were being initially exposed to the statistical structure. And then on the y-axis, how much longer they looked at the stimulus that violated their expectations. Okay, and you can see that those two things were um, very correlated. So more activity in lateral prefrontal cortex was very correlated with um, more looking at the stimuli that violated their predictions. Okay, so that is one region of, media, of prefrontal cortex that seems to have a function similar to that in adults and that predicts infant's choice of where to look. Okay, what about medial prefrontal cortex? So here we use the same control condition as before, the um, person just saying a stream of nonsense syllables, um, but we compared that to um, another speaker who also repeated nonsense syllables. Um, so we didn't change the content of the speech at all, but what we changed is the facial expression and tone of voice. So we tried to increase the reason for infants to believe that this speaker was self-relevant and valuable, a, a potential valuable partner for the input. So here's what that looks like. Gacy follow Namu. Okay, and we compare that speech to somebody speaking in um, adult directed process. Okay, so the idea then is they're both speaking the same nonsense, but one of the speakers has the valence and prosody to suggest that their speech is, re they are a relevant partner for the infant. And here we predict that it will be medial prefrontal cortex that would distinguish between these two speakers during the initial encoding period. Um, and we found that in two separate experiments. This is in infants aged nine to 12 month old. Um, and this one is in infants aged uh, six to seven month old. Okay, so as we predicted, there's more activity in medial prefrontal cortex while watching the valued and self-relevant speaker. And this is, consistent with lots of data from many other labs um, showing medial prefrontal cortex is recruited for this kind of uh, stimulus in babies. But here's the key prediction. Right? So the idea here is social value is a different reason babies might have to look at something in the world. So to test that after they had been exposed to the speech, we then showed the babies the two speakers side by side and both were silent. And then we asked, how much did infants look at the two speakers? And um, so combining the data from, from all sets of experiments, from the six to 12 month olds, I'll now show you for each baby, how much activity they had in medial prefrontal cortex when they first saw the two speakers on the x-axis, and then on the y-axis, how much did they prefer to look at the infant-directed speaker in the silent preference test? And again, uh, those two are super correlated. Okay, so as I hope it's clear, the overall design of this study was to try to let us test the hypothesis 
that there is a dissociation in the underlying cognitive and neural mechanisms that predict uh, infants' endogenous attention or choice of where to look. So when infants are learning to predict the statistical structure of the world, they're encoding that in lateral prefrontal cortex, and that will predict looking to violations of the expected stimuli. But when what they're doing is recognizing a potentially valuable social partner, then a different region, medial prefrontal cortex, is recruited and um, that will predict subsequent preferential looking to that speaker. So that was the prediction. And we tested this in a group of six and seven month old infants who were randomly assigned to one of these two experiments. So they were recruited simultaneously and then randomly assigned either to, so they all had the same adult directed non-statistical control condition, but they were randomly assigned to the experimental condition being either the infant directed feature or the statistical speaker. And you could see here a double dissociation where on the left column, the medial prefrontal cortex, activity during the infant directed speaker predicts greater looking to that speaker's preference in the afterwards. But looking to the statistical speaker does not predict uh, novelty preference. And in the lateral prefrontal cortex, we see the opposite. So greater activity during the statistical speaker predicts longer looking to stimuli that violate their learned expectations. Whereas in lateral prefrontal cortex, greater activity um, during the infant directed speaker does not predict greater looking to that speaker uh, after the encoding. Okay, so just to go back to the bigger picture, Right. The question we have in front of us today is, how can we design things that will learn to think about um, and to interact with human beings the way that infants do? And the first thing I said to you is, as a kind of general big picture theory, I think that computer scientists um, need to think about a distinct social motivation. So infants pay attention to people interactions, but not just as a downstream consequence of a generic motivation to learn about and predict the world. They have separate motivation to attend to people in order to monitor and deepen social relationships that they depend on for their survival. And didn't fully prove this. I think it's still an open and empirical question and actually could use a lot of modeling work. Um, but I gave you two lines of research that I think are really suggestive. One is evidence that infants choose who to pay attention to based on evidence of a social relationship. So if infants have reason to think they're in a social relationship or might be in a social relationship with someone, that's who they look at when they hear somebody calling their name. And um, the second thing I showed you is that uh, infants' attention to social stimuli um, can come from at least two distinct neural bases. So when they're paying attention to speech that violates the learned um, predictable structure of statistics, then that looking um, is predicted by activity in lateral prefrontal cortex. Um, but when they're looking at somebody who was previously speaking to them in infant directed speech, then that looking is predicted by activity in medial prefrontal cortex. And I argued that it's that last one that is evidence of a distinct social motivation guiding infants' attention. Okay, so that's it for this talk. Um, I hope it provokes thoughts for uh, computer scientists and developmental psychologists in the audience. I just wanna say thank you so much to the researchers who did this work, including Gal Rez, Ben Dean, Heather Kozakowski, Ashley Thomas, and Lindsay Powell. Um, to all the members of SACS Lab, to the funders of this research, um, and in particular to the participants and their families. And with that, thank you.